we have to acknowledge that Kosovo met some of the criteria for declaring UDI. Extensive negotiation, we won't comment on the quality of it, but extensive negotiation. The vast majority of the population, in fact, favored UDI. It didn't meet some of the other criteria, like self-supporting economy. Mind you, there are a number of basket case nations around the world that continue to survive. So it's not the pass or fail of the qualifying criteria for UDI that bothers me. It's how the Kosovars orchestrated their independence that bothers me and raises issues about its legitimacy. In his book, Blood and Belonging, Michael Ignatiev explains much better than I that during the Cold War, there was a glue that held countries together and, and thwarted their internal stresses. That glue was provided by the fact that both superpowers wanted you. You could be some obscure country in the middle of nowhere, but if you had a port or an airfield, either the Soviet bloc or NATO wanted you on their side and were prepared to pay for it. When the Cold War ended and the wall came down, that glue disintegrated, and an awful lot of scores started to be settled, and a lot of internal strife took over and ended up in civil war. And Yugoslavia was the first to disintegrate. Slovenia and Croatia declared their independence, encouraged by Germany. And on the 6th of April, I remember it well, I'd only been in Sarajevo for two weeks, Bosnia followed. Now there was a large Serbian minority there, and they had the distinct advantage of a departing First World Army, the Yugoslavian National Army, that was leaving behind a good deal of military hardware and a bunch of conscript soldiers that had been born in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Bosnian Muslims were larger in numbers, but at a distinct disadvantage, so they turned to North American PR firms to plead their case internationally, and they were immensely successful. Some events, not all that have been accredited to them, accredited to them, were orchestrated in Sarajevo. They were improperly blamed on the Serbs, but the fact enhanced international sympathy and support for the Bosnian Muslims. And ultimately, NATO intervened along with the U.S.-inspired Croatian ground offensive that resulted in the Dayton Accord. Now, a short distance away in Kosovo, the Bosniak's success in convincing the West to take up their side was not lost on a terrorist organization branded so by the CIA. I'm talking about the Kosovo Liberation Army. And no one can accuse the Serbs of treating the Kosovo Albanians with kid gloves. Over the decades following World War II, restricting service and top jobs in the civil service, universities, sometimes language rights, was ill-founded, but it wasn't brutal, particularly while maintaining a massive, what we Canadians call, equalization payments and granting various degrees of autonomy. But the KLA correctly anticipated that if they commenced a campaign of killing Serbian security forces, the central government, Reid Milosevic, would overreact. Because that's exactly what governments do. I don't have to tell this audience about the FLQ uh, blowing up a few mailboxes, which was followed by the equivalent of martial law. They were right. They were absolutely right. Their campaign culminated in January 99 with the so-called Ratchik Massacre. Universally blamed uh, on the Serbs, uh, done so by the American head of the European <coughs> Observer Mission in Kosovo. Mind you, he did have a large American flag on his vehicle and not the uh, European Union uh, symbol. Forty-five Kosovar civilians were found slaughtered in a ditch near the village of Ratchik. The world was shocked. Western leaders gathered twice during the month of February in Rambouillet in France to force Milosevic to back off and order his forces out of Kosovo. The fact that two subsequent forensic investigations confirmed that the massacre was staged, that these were KLA fighters dressed in civilian clothes and then machine gun, but magically 
no blood was found in the ditch around the bodies uh, is conveniently ignored, was conveniently ignored by the West and continues to be, quite frankly. Now, the Rambouillet Agreement contained two clauses that the drafters, read Madeleine Albright, knew Milosevic could never accept. One was NATO would have total freedom of movement within Yugoslavia. And two, the will of the people of Kosovo could well be the determining factor on the future of Kosovo in three years. And there was no way that Milosevic could or would sign such an agreement. On the 24th of March, the 79-day bombing campaign against Serbian forces in Kosovo and civilian targets in Serbia began. In other words, NATO became the KLA's Air Force. Ironically, the bombing campaign was halted when Finnish diplomat Atasari convinced NATO, U.S., <laughs> to remove the two causes that had led to the bombing in the first place. And concurrently, a U.N. resolution, you all know, 1244, granted substantial authority to Kosovo within the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Substantial autonomy, but within the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. What followed was the expulsion, or to use the Balkan term, ethnic cleansing of tens of thousands of Serbs in spite of the presence of NATO peacekeepers, and the appointment and election of leaders that Canadians should find outrageous. In 2006, Jim was appointed Prime Minister. Cheku was a captain in the JNA prior to 91. He became an instant general in the Croatian army and was in charge in 1996 during the medic pocket battle or massacre, depending on your point of view, where my regiment, the Patricias, at least thwarted some of the raping and murdering that was going on. He was also a commanding general during Operation Storm, a US-inspired ground offensive down through the Kraina and into Bosnia. Any number of people think NATO bombing brought about Dayton. It wasn't. It was the ground offensive that began threatening Banja Luka. During this particular operation, these brave men, led by Cheku with first world armaments, shelled and overran Canadian peacekeepers manning neutral positions armed only with small arms. The current Prime Minister, Hashim Thaci, leader of the KLA, according to open reports, has occasionally bragged about orchestrating the Ratchik massacre. And at 28 years of age and 14 inches taller than Madeleine Albright, became bosom buddies at Rambouillet. In fact, the word is she gave him her cell phone and said, call me, and helped her, helped convince her that NATO should bomb Serbia. Now, if a nation is to be judged by the quality of its leaders, Kosovo's got a rough future. Following UDI, the Western hype suggested the international community would rush to recognize Kosovo. It didn't happen. 40 of the 192 countries in the United <laughs> Nations have done so. The leaders of the majority of the world's population have not. China, Russia, Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country, are but four of 152. Canada, unfortunately, did. Some have suggested, and I have no way to confirm this and quite frankly don't believe it, that it's a quid pro quo for Americans reinforcing us in southern Afghanistan, which they will do in large numbers later this year. Perhaps we did so so we don't acknowledge the mistake of the bombing campaign itself. So ladies and gentlemen, we now have a statelet with a foreign presence, drugs, and prostitution as the only sources of income led by individuals directly responsible for war crimes. All the result of a brilliant PR campaign. Go figure.